Can you guys hear me? Thanks. Um, I think this is going into the overflow room too, so if anybody wants to sit, you can go out there. Um, hi, my name is Josh Kleinpeter. I work for AT&T um, on the OpenStack team there. And we're going to hold a fun reference architecture uh, panel. Um, and my question to you guys, you can introduce yourself and tell me what the hell does that mean? Um, let's start with Randy Bias from Cloud Scaling. I'm Randy Bias, the CTO and co-founder of Cloud Scaling. We're uh, I'm most notorious for sort of being one of the first deployers of production OpenStack in uh, 2011, both Swift and uh, Nova at that time, so very early, and part of the initial 2010 launch. Um, so you asked what we think about reference architectures. Um, this is a very tricky question from my perspective because um, a lot of times what's in a reference architecture are uh, prescriptions that create lock-in. Like a reference architecture that has NetApp in it creates a lock-in around NetApp. It makes assumptions about the network, it makes assumptions about the storage platform that aren't necessarily helpful. So when we think about reference architectures for our product, we try to make what we call a, a modular reference architecture. So we've tried to create a sort of meta architecture, a way to actually build new reference architectures. And so that's how we try to sort of think about it, something that's more flexible so that we can kind of make it fit a bunch of different kinds of scenarios and situations. Hello, I'm Randy Perriman from Dell. Um, what do we think about reference architectures? Essentially, reference architectures, to me, I agree with you, it locks us in, but <coughs> at the same time, it allows us to use that as a starting point and a conversation starter. And then allows us to come back as we are in the process of talking with customers and allow us to <coughs> allow us to, as time goes throughout the sales process, we can always bring that back and then as we're doing the installation, use that as our goal and then eventually as our support. My name is uh, Rick Rowling. I'm from Hewlett Packard. I'm a lead architect of the cloud system uh, matrix solution, which is a private cloud solution that, that to, to the question is, um, is based on a, a couple of reference architectures. We like them, we love them, we ship them. We find that nearly all customers like to tweak them. In fact, they think their own deployment is a reference architecture. So we end up being fairly flexible based on customer need. We start from, from key positions and then that expands um, based on customer feedback. With OpenStax, which we've introduced recently into our product line, we find customers are, let's say, much more aggressive in terms of the kinds of expansions of reference architectures we're, we're creating, which shouldn't be a surprise to the folks here. So I'm Robert Starmer, uh, Principal Architect for Cloud in our Solutions Unit at Cisco. Um, we've built reference architectures and reference systems for a number of years, uh, specifically around network service, and now as we do more compute, um, adding in OpenStack and other technologies on top of that. One of the things that we get out of references uh, is not that it is the one and only answer, as I think everybody else has said here. It is really sort of a baseline to work from. But with that baseline, we can provide some validation and some data around what that reference can do so that when a customer is looking to extend and expand and build their specific version of something, they know, hey, do we need to tweak up, down, or can we change it in different ways? So we find them to be very useful from that sort of baseline perspective, something to start from. And so um, then do you, do you tune your, your reference architecture towards ease of use versus resiliency or, or speed or something like that? Um, at least for the base one and then go from there? So we, we tend to tune for sort of a midline. So we'll look at resilience. I mean, part of our network model, our historical network model has always been to provide resiliency in the infrastructure that we build. So that's a core model that we have always had. So for example, we build redundant networks as part of our reference architectures. A lot of people, especially in the OpenStack community, are, are building against a different systems model in the end. They're looking at things where they might do a single top of rack switch instead of multiple, or single interfaces into the, into the actual server uh, components. We give you the option to do whatever you need to after the fact, but we want to find that sort of middle ground. When we look at um, the compute models that we build against, we do the same sort of thing. We'll pick something that's you know, middle grade CPU for our reference architecture, knowing that there are certain users that will need the absolute top bin part. There are others that will say, look, I don't even need that. I'll go with a bottom bin component because it's a more appropriate solution for my end-to-end -end result. 
right? So we sort of try to find the middle ground in how we build our references. It gives us a, a better baseline to build up or down from. Um, does a reference architecture mean that you can go to production with it? So um, from HP's perspective, uh, the reference architectures that we sort of qualify, again, we're, we're very flexible on the customer side. Um, they're production architectures. So not only are they production from a test and support perspective, some of those architectures are production in terms of we, we pre-manufacture them. Um, but as everybody's been saying, once it gets out to customer site, then there's, there's opportunity to modify that. There is some, some boundaries to the modification, but as every year go, goes by in our private cloud solutions, that boundary seems to expand. So um, one of the things I kind of left out is that even though we have kind of this modular reference architecture, we actually operate from a baseline, uh, which is Amazon Web Services. I consider that to be a de facto architectural standard. Um, and part of the reason is that Google Compute Engine, which will be the other major public cloud here shortly, um, is about 95 to 99% architecturally overlapping with Amazon Web Services. So I just think that uh, rather than recreate stuff, it's better to look at, you know, kind of who, whoever's dominant and sort of look at them and, and reference off of them. Um, but the key there is that a lot of those systems are really designed for scale. So what we try to do is make our reference architecture designed for scale. And the problem is sometimes if you want to make it smaller, like if you want to fit it on four servers, I, I, I can't do that. Like I can't take my architecture and squeeze it down on four servers. So the answer for us is that our reference architecture can be put in production, but maybe you can't if you built a reference architecture that's for like a pilot deployment or a dev test or a QA deployment, because you're just gonna make a different set of trade-offs for a production system than you will for a non-production system. Um, so, where's my question? Losing my brain. Um, so you all have a reference architecture. The community doesn't. Is that something that we should do as a community to provide out there to say, hey, you're a deployer. Here's a reference architecture. And if so, how do you, it seems like we should remain agnostic of vendors as much as possible to not be prescriptive in, to Randy's example, a NetApp, not picking on NetApp. Um, <laughs> I don't think Randy is either. Um, you know. What do you do there? I don't know, Randy, other Randy. <laughs> well, the community as a whole coming up with a reference architecture, like you said, it's gonna be difficult because there is so many different vendors and representative in the community. Allowing each vendor come up with their own reference architecture that they have validated against the current OpenStack <coughs> um, product is to me the right thing to do because then it also allows the OpenStack community to concentrate on what is what they are working on best, which is designing the next level of our product. But does that then relate to interoperability, right? And because it seems like to me it does where you've got a reference architecture and then you've got, you know, if we want to do interop between clouds, you you need to do that at the API level, but then you know if you can show somebody here's a reference architecture that allows for that interop, could be important. I was I was going to say to um, yes or no on OpenStack reference architecture that I think there needs to be more than one, not a reference architecture, but a small set. They need to be use case based. And like I've been saying, we we're very private cloud focused. A lot of the folks here and a lot of the work in OpenStack is very operator uh, public cloud focused. So I think there's a couple of um, maybe um, choice points set for reference architectures. And, and in either case, you're right, interop. For us, it means more heterogeneity across other vendors, gear, including the, the folks here sitting with me is an important aspect of that. So a logical reference architecture with, with from, uh, at least from our perspective, th the right components, uh, not tied to specific uh, Cisco hardware gear, or specific HP or Dell um, you know, compute gear is, uh, is something that we would uh, want to participate in from a community perspective. So I'm, I'm gonna push back on that a little bit because um, I think it gives the wrong idea in, in terms of the last piece you said there. Um, it's not public versus private cloud. It's elastic cloud versus enterprise virtualization. So a private cloud that is built around enterprise virtualization doesn't look anything like Amazon. But you can build a private cloud that looks exactly like Amazon. So it's not, it's not that the community is focused on 
uh, public cloud is that they're focused more on sort of a scale out, more elastic cloud model, right? Um, and then in terms of sort of like this interop problem, I mean, it is a big problem, but the reality is, is if we do premature interoperability, we will stifle innovation, right? We will. So we have to be smart about this. And the way we've been talking about it at the, in, in the OpenStack Board of Directors, I'm one of the directors, um, is that we've been talking about sort of coming up with a baseline reference stack, ref stack. You might have seen some of the uh, presentations here on it. And the idea is, is that, you know, there's enough common, you know, denominator capability so that you can kind of have an SQL 92 of OpenStack. What is the absolute minimum functionality that has to be the same across all OpenStack implementations and build towards interop on that as a beginning point. And then have flavors kind of to your point, right? So here's like the enterprise virtualization flavor that you can kind of layer on top of it. Here's the AWS flavor so that people can do the different things they want to do in terms of innovation in the ecosystem because it's still too early to try to clamp down, but try to put some you know guide rails around it so that it's not everybody running in different directions. I guess my, my only comment to that though would be that uh, you know if we start talking about flavors and start talking about differentiation, somehow the APIs I think need to still stay consistent. So if we have consistent APIs, the differences tend to be uh, at the potentially the hardware level or the sorts of services that you can implement but those services still have to be presentable through the API. So if I have a, a systems model that, that, you know, like for example, just thinking of the quantum level model, I talk about a service that is a network domain, right? Much like I talk about uh, a compute domain within New Nova or a Swift storage model. I don't have to implement Swift per se. I mean, you know, there are plenty of people that build OpenStack clouds right now that aren't using Swift as a part of OpenStack. But do we make that a part of the reference? You have to reference how you would implement Swift, even though there are, uh, is a large number of, of people that might not even use that particular technology, right? I, I think that, that we can get away with saying, here is the reference architecture, here are all the pieces that are core to OpenStack, and so yes, you should implement them if you want to. Here is the reference that, for example, Cisco has defined for how you could do that. We have different references from everybody else as well. It doesn't mean that you then have to say, oh, but here's the more generic reference because at the API level, they should all interoperate. If I want to migrate an application that I deployed on a Cisco reference architecture OpenStack, it should still work on a Dell reference architecture OpenStack, right? Or even on the cloud scaling system within the limitations of, like you said, it can't necessarily deploy it on four nodes, four compute nodes, but the, the APIs are still consistent. Right? Yeah, but see, this is the thing, right, is that there's no, there's no, um, there's no agreement in the OpenStack community about that. Assuming the board is sort of a representative in the microcosm of the macrocosm, uh, we had hour-long debates on Sunday about whether OpenStack is the APIs or the code. And there are very, very valid positions for one position or the other. And it's really hard to say. Like, in some ways, it's, you're actually not allowed to call it OpenStack if you don't use Swift. I know people do that. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm simply saying, that we as a community have not come to an agreement on that piece. So it's really hard right now to come down definitively and say, look, as long as the APIs are the OpenStack APIs, whatever's behind it doesn't matter because that's actually not true. It, it, it does matter. You can't use the OpenStack name now, right now, without using the OpenStack code. I mean, that's part of the rules. Now, should it be that way? I don't know, but we have to kind of sort through that together. Well, to that point, we don't have code for everything. I mean, what's volume, right? It, LVM? Like, probably not. Well, or how do, you, how do you deal with the differentiation between being able to talk to LPAR and VMware and Zen and KVM and anything else that might actually be implementing the compute backend for your system, right? It, that's not defined as a requirement, right? I mean, you could say, look, I, my reference architecture has to support all of them. That might be very difficult to achieve. I, I think maybe what you were talking about earlier, Randy, was if we had a reference architecture that said, look, you have to use the code. Let's assume that that's maybe going to be a requirement. And you have to support all the core parts of OpenStack, right? Again, a good requirement. But there are certainly going to be back-end differences that, that you can support in different ways. And, and so there are then a, potentially a set of flavors, a, a more resilient infrastructure that may or may not be appropriate to everybody's reference. But uh, still, if I, take it, if I take something that I would deploy on a Cisco, if, if, you know, if again, if I'm going to say I'm resilient and you're super scale, right? You can still take what you would deploy on my infrastructure and map it to your infrastructure. The back end might provide different classes of service or what have you, but it's still an open stack deployment, and so my system should be able to translate between the two. I think that would be a great way for us to provide a, a consistency across reference architectures while still allowing us all to provide some differentiation. Right. 
How okay, should sorry, I? Sorry, sorry, not to bogart the mic, but yeah, I, 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 I completely agree. And, and this is part of the thing about the ref stack stuff is that we were talking about, look, you know, everybody's got their own reference architecture. How do we resolve this? And one of the ways is to use heat or heat templates, at least, as sort of a way to describe your architecture. And then those of us who've built our own, you know, provisioning and lifecycle management systems, we can, you know, actually feed them with that template. And then there could be a baseline plus the flavor that actually, you know, basically drives the layout of the physical infrastructure of the cloud. And if you can do that, then it makes it a little bit cleaner. And then over time, you know, I might be able to make my product actually implement your flavor, even though it doesn't now, um, by simply using that. Um, so then how does, to your heat point, how does deployment mechanism play into this? Is is the reference architecture just the end state and however it got there, it got there, whether I'm manually doing it using heat, using chef, using whatever? Or, because I mean, right now there's lots of implementations of this is how you deploy and I see basically every company implementing it and there's no one one standard there. Um, yeah, I think that um, this notion of deploy is a pretty great question because when we talk about ref arches for our customers, it's not necessarily just the end state. It's a starting state. It's the, the process of getting to the end state. But as we talk about an open stack wide uh, set of ref arches, back to my point before, I think, um, yeah, when we, if you're going to prescribe or strongly encourage certain um, deployment technology or deployment solutions to help you get to that ref arch, then you're starting to, uh, that, that's, a, that's a pretty fine line that, that we start to walk. So that, that's a great point. So obviously, by the way I'm saying this, I think that's maybe something that well, ought to be one level back, or maybe that's a flavor extension to the point before that that's sort of there are choice points there for deployment because in you know unlike Nova or or Glance or some of the other services, deployment's not ubiquitous, uh, single service uh, in OpenStack today. Um, if the community would provide a reference architecture, what if we used Open Compute as kind of the hardware model and have it completely agnostic? What do you think about using that? that kind of uh, architecture. <laughs> the non um, well, as you know, that's only one part of the equation, right? It's just the hardware architecture. It doesn't handle the network architecture, which is problematic. Um, uh, so I've spent a lot of time talking to the open compute guys for several years now, and um, I think it would be great if we could work with them on this. And they, what they've done is a little bit akin to kind of what Apple did uh -oh, with the carriers, where they um, <laughs> kind of drove, uh, uh, they, they, they actually told the carriers how they were going to bring the iPhone to market rather than the reverse, as it usually is, right? Um, and so that now the OCP guys kind of tell the hardware vendors kind of this is a spec you implement. And, and that, that I think is very powerful. But if you look at a lot of the configurations there, they've been, they're not really appropriate for infrastructure as a service. Like they're just n really not designed in, in a way. So we'd need better engagement from this community to go into OCP and say like, this is what we think it looks like. We need you know, input from probably folks like yourselves here on the panel. Um, to basically give them a, a something that we could use. And then I think it, it potentially would be great for uh, compute and storage to actually have that kind of open standard. Um, people m might not know it, but Amazon Web Services, they actually go um, out and they bid, to, they get bids from five different vendors each time uh, for their hardware because they're using such bare bones hardware that they're able to make it fairly interchangeable. It doesn't have any vendor secret sauce in it. You know, one of the now I'm going to get in trouble. One of the problems with the enterprise vendors historically is that they've added special extensions to IPMI or special extensions to their little secret sauce HBA, or they load their own firmware on the Seagate disk drives, like HP firmware and Seagate disk drives. And then like open source tools don't work with that. So what we do need is we need the, the hardware to be as open as the software so that we can drive it and run it and manage it. Hardware guys? Yeah, I was going to say the um, starting something like open compute is not a bad idea. I said earlier, uh, logical reference architecture where where hardware specific or abstracted, it, I think is a pretty good idea. Um, network design is an interesting topic that we don't have to go into now, but that's I think that's an important part of at least any ref arch that I want to give to my customers or, or a set, like I said before, need to have network design uh, fully fully described in, in that as well. Um, as a vendor with with secret sauce. Um, as long as our customer is going to pay us for that secret sauce, we're happy to include that on, 
on as many of our hardware products as, as we can, but I realize that that also complicates at times our ability to say plug our, our differentiation into, into a standard reference architecture. Well, I guess I could also say that um, you know we also have secret sauce. We have you know as I think Randy was maybe hinting some of the network components that also have these secret bits and things that you can twiddle. Um, I, I think if you were to say that there is a reference architecture and you wanted to push it down into the hardware layer, saying look, here are the base capabilities that the hardware has to provide, and maybe Open Compute is the right way. You know, again, if we can get them to do some things that that give the entire community the right infrastructure to build on, we can say look, this is a good reference platform. Sure. Right? If we can implement that same reference platform with other services like the, the compute that we sell or the network that we sell or compute from Cisco, network from hard, uh, from HP or, or, or vice versa or, or even Dell components, whatever it is, right? We take all those pieces together and say that, hey, I have the, the, the IPMI tools I need. I might not be able to use the extensions as a, a part of my reference architecture, but at least I know that I can plug any compute component into the, into the system and it will provide the, the base functionality, right? Um, so I think that there is a way to say that there is even at that at that compute level a reference architecture at the network level a set of base services that have to be there to pull the package. Hey, I think that's a good reference you know baseline that we need to get to, um, and we don't necessarily have to try to define uh, you know the the actual IPMI BIOS version that is that is implemented in that hardware, right? So again, it sort of says here's the API for the hardware layer, the API infrastructure that that has to provide as well, and so we can keep it at one level of abstraction from the actual function. And in a sense, that's what we've done with OpenStack, right? It provides a, a, an abstraction for the actual implementation of the, the deployment of a virtual machine. And it's opened the, up the possibility of using bare metal, right, for, for VM deployment or for compute entity deployment. Um, and vice versa, you can do virtual networks on top of systems rather than hardware networks on top of systems. So I think the pieces do actually work very well if you can define that abstraction layer uh, for a reference architecture. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think if we could, I mean, is that a feasible thing to do? I mean, I have like here's a spec for IPMI, here's a spec for configuring RAIDs, here's a spec for configuring switches, and and as long as people started implementing those things, I then think I can because from my team's perspective, we're all about automating and automating, not just deploying OpenStack, but configuring all of our hardware. Right. Well, I think if you want to do bare metal, right, and, and you want that to be something that's possible not just with a very specific vendor's hardware, then you have to say, here are the capabilities that the bare metal system has to provide, right? So you've already sort of started to define an API for what that looks like. Uh, it might define a specific IPMI version because that's the only one that supports the features we need to implement X, right? Um, but beyond that, I, again, I, my view has always been if you can define a reference architecture that provides some ability to be flexible, Right, you get a lot further than if you say this is the only way that you can implement this one particular function. Right now, at the same time, that that's that's maybe a little bit opposed to what we actually have. Right, there's only one way to implement the Nova API, and that has to be that way. Right, so so um, it would be nice. It's a little bit of a pipe dream. I don't know if we can get there. I, you know, we um, we're constantly fighting hardware. It's like it's like nonstop. The way I always think about cloud scaling is we're sort of like a a next generation sy systems business. We have all the problems of EMC and NetApp and Cisco and Juniper, except you know we don't sell the hardware. So we have all this open source software <laughs> um, and it has to run on top of arbitrary hardware. So we have to control and manage the hardware really tightly. And we find variations at the hardware level that are just, they're mind boggling. I'll give you an example. Uh, we're doing an appointment in Russia. The guys are in there and they find out that at arbitrary times when they're booting up the boxes, on the mini boot, uh, our little interim, you know, kind of tools uh, uh, system under Linux, um, they're trying to configure the RAID, and at totally non-deterministically, sometimes the drives are numbered from slot 64 instead of slot zero. We have no idea what's going on, right? So it turns out that LSI has logic in their RAID controllers, these new RAID controllers that we had not certified yet, that talk to the SAS expander and that detected our SAS expander as being a Dell SAS expander, which it was not, it was Quanta. And then what happened is when it's Dell, when it detected it sometimes, it starts numbering the drives from 64 because Dell's decided, and I'm not trying to dig on Dell here, I'm just trying to point out there's variations because of the secret sauce, but Dell wants their drives numbered starting at 64. I mean, 
that's a problem because it's really hard to uncover because each hardware vendor has done slightly different things sometimes to make their kind of integrated systems work well. So when you take open source software and you start talking to it, uh, you have problems. Like when we were talking to HP JBODs at Korea Telecom, we tried to use uh, open source tools to talk SES to the enclosures and they, it wouldn't talk SES to us over the SAS bus. But we went to a generic you know, JBOD and it worked. So I mean, I think some of the things that the vendors have to do is actually kind of make their stuff a little less smart, you know, the Dell C series kind of stuff, um, and to add less secret sauce for the open compute style reference hardware. So wouldn't that go back to where each of us, we're developing our own reference architectures, and the reason we, one of the reasons we do that is so then we've proven and tested right. and solved the problems you just described right prior to you going out, so then going out into the field, you know exactly what you're getting. And that's the whole reason behind a reference architecture, correct? Well, from a, hard, from a hardware vendor perspective, that's, what, that's the whole point. Right. From a, a product perspective like mine, or from a customer perspective, that is not the perspective, because they do not want to be locked into a single hardware vendor. They do not want that. That's loud and clear. Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon us to think about what systems companies look like in the future if they're no longer doing a fully integrated system and they're working with lots of open source. Because in that case, it's important for you guys to test against the open source tools. It's important for you guys to work in concert with the Open Compute Project and with OpenStack to basically make certain that your hardware at the low levels, you know, when we're trying to drive it with provisioning systems, does what's expected and there's not large amounts of variation. The provisioning system, though, is that should that be part of the OpenStack standard? Um, I think a lot of people have a lot of secret sauce there right now, so I don't, right. I don't think that that's going to happen. Yeah, I think, I think you're making a good point about we aren't abandoning our secret sauce, but there's got to be a balance between uh, if we're going to participate in ref arches, then we need to do it in such a way that, that the use cases you described could be successful, while at the same time, for those customers who want to choose the vendor uh, specific uh, enhancements, they can pursue those sort of as a second wave of, of deployment or configuration after we've gotten through sort of the first wave, which is more more standard or more or general purpose. So I think I agree with that. It seems like this gets into who your who your expected end user for the architecture is, right? If this is an enterprise customer, you know, a lot of enterprises do want, okay, I want to just deal with HP, Cisco, Dell, whoever. Right, versus somebody that wants to build the next Amazon, probably would want to follow the Amazon model and just, you know, spew out to everybody. I think certainly HP's product line in the cloud system, we see most customers deploying new projects with a, a very HP-centric um, hardware set, a very HP-centric architecture. That doesn't mean they're locked into HP. They have other projects in the same, same group that are running um, uh, other vendors' hardware, and then maybe over time, if they're successful with an initial play with one of our sort of HP-centric uh, uh, deployment architectures, they'll, they'll want to expand that to include other vendors' um, gear, which we certainly support. So I think um, I think you're right, and I think that um, we, from a customer perspective, see a lot of need for us to be very specific um, in our in our HP products as a part of the RefArch, but we can't only be specific uh, and, and never go beyond that because customers want to want to take us beyond that as soon as they've been successful with what we start out as very HP centric at the beginning. Yeah, I think from the you know from the perspective of a of a an open stack sanctioned reference architecture, I think we it would make a lot of sense to say, look, here are the base capabilities that we have to have. Right? Here here are the the functions and, you know, the effectively the API calls that have to function properly. And maybe slightly different than what we were talking about in terms of what the OpenStack uh, Foundation is saying is going to be OpenStack, however that en ends up, that the discussion ends up, right? Maybe there are some differences. Um, you know, the, the issue that you ran into with the particular RAID controller, that's a very interesting one, and maybe that is very much a corner case, but still trying to limit that, I mean, okay. One can dream, uh, right? Many more stories. <laughs> but, but if we can at least say, look, if you can implement these base functions and give us the right kind of feedback as to what you've done, right? I mean, in that case, for example, if the system came back and said, look, I gave you ID64. This is the ID you're going to start with. Your code, the, the system code, could actually be a little smarter and say, okay, I know I might see this level of variation. But understanding that level is a, is a, a task in and of itself. 
At the same time, reference architectures that we're going to develop and continue to develop will include value that we can drive you know, through some of the interfaces that we have and, and capabilities that we have to simplify the deployment process. Right? And I think all of us will do that from a, from a systems vendor perspective. It, it is the value that we can give to our customers, simplifies their process of getting it, getting it up and running. But as a reference architecture, I still think that the best way to think of these things is that they're a good baseline, a good sort of starting point for where you might want to take a system over time. How do we, um, how do we then do with the, with the capabilities that don't have implementations in OpenStack? You know, well, I mean, we get rid of Nova Network. What do we do for networking? If we get rid of, well, we don't have a solution for volume. Do we need to make a stance and say, use Moose FS or, you know, use OVS and, you know, whatever? Or, or are we making those choices as part of the reference architecture? I don't I, know I, I because. Think we're we're kind of making those choices as a part of a reference, right? And right now, there are at least, you know, here there are four <laughs> examples of references, right? There are yeah. plenty more out there. Um, and, and in each one of those references, sometimes they're a little bit more prescriptive. I know some of our references are missing probably some of the, the, the actual minute details of how do you set up a particular hypervisor and a particular volume system with that hypervisor to make it as efficient as possible. Probably areas that we need to discover and cover. Um, part of that will then come out of, you know, when you do a deployment, you learn a lot of things that you say, okay, in the next reference architecture, we're going to make sure that we include this because it is a thing that got us in the past, right? And we want to make those reference architectures as simple to deploy as possible and as simple to become flexible as possible, right? So it, it, it's a fine line. And references, I think, were always going to be not the perfect solution for most people, right? Just to add it, I think they've got to be iterative, right? I think. The reference arch that we may produce at the end of Havana is great, but it's got to be it's got to be updated and it's got to be kept kept um, you know moving. And it's a reference architecture in a point of time. And I, just like you said, as as we learn new things or as a new service becomes core and it's time to uh, expand the ref arch, we need to be able to if we're going to do this in an open stack way, it's got to be something that can be can be done and improved from release to release. Can I can I ask Randy a question? Sure. <laughs> so. Why does Dell have the C series? <laughs> the C series is designed specifically around the cloud computing. It is designed with the idea that we are going to be able to put together individual systems that are, in general, for more high density and better compute cycles. Um, actually, wasn't ready to answer questions on, on specific platforms. Um, well, my, the story I heard was that your web scale customers basically asked you to build a platform that had less secret sauce. They wanted more generic servers. They liked Dell as a vendor, but they wanted a simpler system that had less special stuff. I agree with you there to a point, but at the same time, we also have other customers looking at the R series and they love the extras sure. that it buys. Um, and yeah, the I'm whole just, goal. I'm just I trying to get to the point that there, that that the C series, you you created a whole platform line because you right. had very large customers who wanted no secret sauce, right? I can't answer that. I wasn't involved in those. That's a story I heard. So. Okay. Um. <laughs> um. So. that I have on my, uh, um, let's see, so, <laughs> go ahead, ask me, <laughs> I'm like, look, I'm like, wait a minute, I've answered all these things, so, um, at, you know, as part of this, um, how far are we going towards, you know, not just, um, you know, this is a deployed, but like, a deployed, deployed architecture, but, you know, should we get into things like, you know, uh, you, to do this right, you need 10 gig networking, you need to do bonding, you need to do, you know, this type of storage. You should be using, you know, JBODs and that, that type of thing. Or are we, you know, uh, just talking about um, you need to have something that stores stuff? Are you talking about a like, reference platform for that OpenStack is going to say that we have to have, or are you talking about I'm us talking individually? About, uh, well, I'm saying if, if OpenStack said, you know, <laughs> this is what you should do, if we're talking about a production thing, 
you know, yeah, any old switch would work. But if you really wanted to use it, we should tell people, hey, you know, you need to use this ki kind of networking as just a baseline. How, how I think we, we kind of hit on that earlier. You have to be very specific in the set of capabilities. I think that was a phrase you used. Um, yeah. You don't have to say, you know, use JBODs or use, uh, use iSCSI, use, use this specific kind of hardware behind your Swift implementation, but you ought to be specific on capabilities. What, is, what are the performance characteristics you're after? What is the scaling size you want? Um, you know, simultaneous number of users, whatever the whatever those uh, performance or or you know real real world scenario criteria should be, I think it should be framed more in that in that kind of context. You should get help from some of the key customers who are deploying I mean OpenStack today. And there's a lot of there's a lot of work that goes behind. I don't know. Maybe no vendor wants to give that up, but like figuring out how do I build a good Swift cluster. There's a hell of a lot of work behind figuring that right. out. Right, and, and and the thing is that I think with each with each vendor's tweaks to their hardware, there might be different benefits to a specific model. Mm -hmm. I, I think again, if we can if we can structure things in the way of thinking about it from a, a sort of a, a a baseline that you can build from, you know, Randy's organization may be looking more for something that can provide a different class of scale than another customer might be looking for. So it might be this concept of flavors is actually a good way of thinking about even reference architectures. Mm -hmm. I have an enterprise flavor that is designed to support uh, maybe high IO storage because it's really focused more on a data store class of, of infrastructure or a database, you know, classic database class infrastructure. So that's going to force you into potentially higher end uh, storage systems, maybe even, you know, dedicated storage systems versus the, the sort of, of um, embedded, uh, you know, direct attached storage that we're looking at today for a lot of these systems. You know, those sorts of differences might be the kinds of, of areas where you could have multiple reference architectures. Um, you know, the, 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 again, the sort of the baseline models that, that I tend to look at um, seem to be sort of middle of the road, and we're looking at middle of the road performance even for the disks that we choose. You know, we have very high end SSD that may be appropriate for a specific deployment model, but it's not something I would necessarily define as my principal reference architecture because it skews the general cost for most other customers that would want to look at this as well. And so I, I think there has to be a balance in, in the way we think of reference architectures. And from an OpenStack foundation saying, hey, this is the reference model that you would want to use for your reference architecture, um, it, I think that might work if it was, here's a reference model for high performance storage class capability, which is SSD sort of centric, versus here's a model that is more compute centric and really you're looking at how can I get the densest cores into, into my environment, uh, versus I need something that's ultra resilient on the network and can handle Maybe it's video distribution, so I need bandwidth more than I need anything else, right? And and so even those three sort of semi flavors might d define three different reference architectures for the hardware that sits underneath, right? So, so you're talking about different use cases, yeah, and that the reference architecture. So like in designing our reference architecture, one of the things we look at is okay, so are we going to do a storage only, or a good generic one that will handle both compute and storage? or compute only, you know. So you're gonna wanna define your use cases and at the end of the day, if you cannot solve the use case, why are you writing the reference architecture? Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, who, who defines this? I mean, in, in the community, like, is anybody gonna come and step up and say, because, you know, everybody wants their reference architecture, their own thing. Do we get people out of the community to say, we're going to be PTLs and <laughs> define something? Or so where does it come from? Where it comes from? Yeah. The people who are going to use OpenStack. Well, we need to be sitting down right, visiting but with so them. I guess the question is really, are the vendors who have value in their reference architectures going to be willing to step up and say, here's a reference architecture? that you could be using, it, it's... Yes, we, we come up, we have our reference architecture, we're going to give it to our customers. To your, I'm talking I'm sorry, about the community though. Right. Well. Right, this is a very different thing. If somebody pays you, you're right. here. So, so we, we have had success with our reference architectures that are very vendor specific. Um, this OpenStack world, at least for, for, for my product line, is a fairly new, bold world. We're happy to get additional insight and help from a community perspective on, on these more uh, use case specific reference architectures, reference models, we can still take and add value on new, more HP specific reference, reference architectures as well. So it's kind, of a, it's kind of a synergistic thing from my perspective. So, so I think 
this one vendor at least would be happy to uh, to play this sort of layering kind of game with with reference architectures using the community. Yeah, I, I would say that that our reference architectures are open. I mean, we post them and you know we say this is what it is. Here are some of the decisions that we've made. Um, as we develop further and further reference architectures, we're going to provide more information on you know performance that we've been able to gather from these systems and things of that nature. Um, so in general, we've we've made those open to the community anyway. It hasn't been something that we've specifically come to the community to say, hey, here's what we think the reference architecture should be. Um, I, and, and I think that's partially because we're getting requirements to define our reference architectures from the customers that we're working with, right? So we can say, hey, this might be a more video-centric reference architecture, uh, and that might be useful for others to then say, okay, I can base, again, off that sort of midline model that you've built, I can see why you chose the you know, high-performance network interfaces that you chose, um, but I don't quite agree with your storage model, so let me change that out, right? And, and I think there's a, that's available today, I, I think just about from any of us. Maybe it's not quite as open in some cases, or maybe it is. I actually haven't looked to see what, what HP posts for a reference architecture, if there's anything public, but you know, that's, that's I think not the limitation, right? I think, I think being able to say that we know that there are reference architectures for these different systems, again, if the OpenStack community wants that, I think we can absolutely all support it. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I've specifically heard the community stand up and say, if you would just give us one reference architecture, we'd be happy, <laughs> right? Because I don't think it would actually fit, right? People yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. And more importantly, we already have a reference architecture. Here comes my opinion. Um, and it's Amazon Web Services. And I think that if we're looking at a world where we're going to build lots of hybrid clouds and there's going to be lots of interrupt to the major public clouds, and the major public clouds are going to be these very large dominant ones, that it's foolish to make stuff that doesn't look like them. I mean, just you're going to wind up on an island in the same way that we have this problem now where every OpenStack deployment looks like something different than the one next to it. We, it would be better to hub off of those reference architectures and make them better or enhance them than it would be to sort of go your own way. That's just the way I look at the world. I, I still think that there are going to be flavors of those reference architectures, though. Mm. Right? Yeah, but I mean, if you look at AWS today, there's already fl flavors, right? You can do HPC on it, right? You can do high eye up storage. You can do, you know, standard. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. So well, but that is their secret sauce. You don't, I mean, you can kind of like squint and hand wave and say this is what they have underneath there. Well, but, I mean. But we're, what we're thinking like, all right, you know, this is how you should be wiring up your data center or, you know, that well, kind of thing. It's well, there's it, a it consumption, a little there's the consumption side, the what the end user sees, but then there's the operator side, right? right? Well, and I think from the yeah. operator side, that this is where the reference architectures do get interesting. You know, some of the discussions that we've been having even this week are around how do we get more consistent operations model around these systems. And the only way we're going to get there is to have a more consistent set of baseline references that we know, hey, I know how I can operate like you said, a uh, basic Amazon EC2 class cluster, right? If we're going to do an, a, uh, an Amazon HPC class system, there might be different things that we would want to understand from that operational model. Um, and we can derive some of that baseline, again, for the community benefit from a reference architecture for that class of system. So if, if we, as a community, say, look, let's just take the Amazon systems models that exist and use those and define some baseline reference architectures because it helps us to drive a better operational system right, uh, getting better statistics collection, and maybe I, I need to, you know, poll more rapidly when I start looking at polling against my VMs to determine what's really running, because I might be able to, uh, you know, support a better HPC class system at some point, uh, if that's the direction I want to start taking my cloud, right? I, I think there might be some real value there, so maybe something we do need to really look into a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so any smart people out there have any great questions that they want to ask these brilliant guys? Um, is what's missing from this conversation perhaps a reference architecture for interoperability and a corresponding hardware compatibility list that goes with that? Well, again, I think if we're defining reference architectures as a set of API class models, right? It, it, it comes back to the use case, right? What use cases are we looking at? And we can define those reference architectures. And then anybody can say, look, I want to support a, you know, video streaming reference architecture. Here are some of the things that we know you're going to need. High performance network, probably better than gig speed networks, and you're going to need potentially high performance disk as well in order to get lots of streams out of a system. But if that's not your use case, then that reference architecture may not be as useful to you and the hardware models that may be mapped to that use case aren't necessarily going to be as specific. 
I don't know if you want to get to the point of an HCL because I might come out with a new disk that is much better for that reference architecture than we had before. And I don't want to say, well, let's not think about that, right? Back to my point about the capacity of the machine. One use case is interoperability and elasticity um, to be able to you know, move that, those VMs or deploy to anything. Um, that's one use case. I mean, where the hardware vendors are coming in here and saying, here's a use case for, you know, like video streaming. That's, that's a use case that you could really optimize for on your hardware. Um, but interoperability is a use case in and of itself. Is well, what I'm saying. Yeah, but I mean, I think even a reference architecture, it doesn't limit you. I mean, if we were to say, look, here's a reference architecture for video, and you suddenly find that you need, you know, another 100 gigabit per second out of multiple sites for, for that video streaming service because you're, you've been so successful, it doesn't mean that you can't deploy that same class of service elsewhere. The performance may not be good as, as good as what the reference architecture has defined, right? And so then it's really more a question of, can I define my performance characteristics for a particular set of workloads so that if I do migrate from one environment to another, I know what impact that might have, right? And that, I think, is a much harder thing to specify. You know, starting from a baseline is always good, and, and maybe that's really, the, I think, the point we're trying to make. Is it fair to say that, excuse me, is it fair to say that the reference architecture problem is better suited to vendors, whereas the OpenStack Foundation is better suited to set a set of standards and practices for operations? I like that idea. And and just, just a bit ago, we were talking about you know, some, some sort of standard description from an open attack perspective that could be sort of derived into more vendor specific, even hardware compatibility list specific um, uh, descriptions from, from us as vendors, but starting from some unifying point which the community could define. So I like what you're saying in that regard. So what we've seen in the past is that there's different levels of interop, right? So, so like with databases, we didn't get past SQL 92, right? Um, and so sometimes, y you know, we don't know where this will end up. Right, but what we do know is that um, foundations before like this, like the Linux Foundation, what they focused on is ad Linux adoption. And then what's happened is that as people have consumed and used Linux, um, winners have, have risen to the top because that's what customers wanted, that's what people wanted. Um, and so I think that's what we're looking at now. It's the early days, there has to be enough flexibility in the system that a variety of different approaches can go out to the market and then people are gonna choose what they think works best for them and then as the OpenStack Foundation fosters adoption and, and, and we get you know, even more people using the system, there's gonna be patterns that emerge and then you know, kind of after the fact, we'll standardize those and, and we'll have interrupt between those kinds of standards. I think that's probably how it'll, how it'll uh, you know, go. So the majority of the deployments are not public, um, they're private. And I haven't really heard a lot of discussion in this about private clouds. And I, th I think the majority of you guys are public cloud vendors, correct? Uh, no. No? The majority of my right. deployments are yeah. private. Yeah, maybe none of us are then, in fact. Um, so so it, it seems that everyone's doing reference or implementations based on like the idea of, of following what large public clouds are doing. But is, is that really um, what we should be looking at for private implementations? You and don't, you don't read my blog, do you? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so my position is that cloud computing is the kind of computing that Google and Amazon and Facebook and Twitter are doing. Virtual machines on demand, that's virtual machines on demand that doesn't have jack diddly to do with cloud computing. It's absolutely, completely irrelevant. Otherwise, bare metal would matter and Google wouldn't be a cloud because they don't use any virtualization. VMs on demand is a total sideshow and people need to forget about that. If you want a private cloud, in my opinion, you need a cloud that is an elastic cloud that looks and feels and smells like Amazon and Google. Anything else is just kind of like mental masturbation. So we, we aren't quite as extreme in that viewpoint from an HP <laughs> perspective. Um, I would our private not. cloud customers want <laughs> virtual machines on demand. They do actually, to, to your point, they do look a lot, at least what Amazon provided is sort of the spec or the reference, I wouldn't call it a reference arch, but a reference spec for what what cloud ought to be. Now they're looking to us more and more, saying we want OpenStack, which is good because that's where we're, where we're playing. Um, so I, th I think it's kind of a combination we see from our private cloud customers. So a, f a follow up to that so that I can get really clarify my question more. Um, it's not specifically um, just following the, the cloud model by these public vendors. It's more, um, do you not feel that, um, these, that OpenStack should integrate more with 
a, an organization's already current setup, like LDAP integration that works with our authentic authentication authorization. I mean, how are we looking at reference implementations yeah, I, from I, a private I think, perspective I from think that? You're, you're making a good point, right? The, the fact that right now <coughs> the default model for Keystone is a separate ent entity of, of authentication is not something that's going to work as you try to implement this in, in your organization. And even as we think about you know, cloud migration, hey, I want to be able to use any cloud provider uh, to, to support the sorts of services that we're talking about, this idea of interop, well, I'm effectively going to have to have some form of open ID class, you know, shared infrastructure for authentication at the back end of the system. Doesn't mean that Keystone has to go away, but we have to find a way to make it easier to integrate. And you can integrate Keystone with LDAP, so I mean, I know that you can actually implement these things. Do our reference designs cover how to implement that? I think the, 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 the point I was trying to make earlier about operationalizing these things by having a, a decent set of systems-focused reference architectures maybe sort of starts to think about that. How do you do that integration? How do you tie into maybe your enterprise class storage that already exists that you want to leverage for the new applications that you're deploying within the sort of the compute side of the, this new cloud that you're building? And how do you migrate to that? That's an integration problem, right? I mean, people use AD and LDAP to authenticate in order to get access to AWS and Google Compute Engine today. I mean, that, that's just a, that's a sideshow. It doesn't have anything to do with the architecture. Um, so, are we building this for operators? I mean, it seems like we, um, you know, we, we want more people in the community. We want, want people to build, be building OpenStack clouds, however they're doing it. And it, to me, providing a good reference architecture for these guys where they don't have to, you know, a great deploy guy that they get out there and they're successful could be really important to us to get great uptake in the community. Well, I think the, the point of cloud infrastructure, at least for, uh, you know, in the private cloud space, is to provide a more flexible infrastructure for the end users within that enterprise. I think the same thing applies to the cloud in general, right? The reason that, at least as I understand it, the reason that Amazon took off was that it was very easy for any developer to get access to the things that they were looking for, compute, storage, network, right? By, by enabling that, they were able to accelerate their, deploy their development process, they were able to get things done when they couldn't before. So in a sense, yes, I, I think OpenStack is an operator tool. And our ability to provide a reference architecture that makes it easy to get that operator tool running, and then again, the ability to then define how you can operationalize that and manage that tool, um, I think are key things that, that are defined in references. Right? This is a base way of doing it. It doesn't necessarily, you know, to your point, it doesn't mean that there isn't an integration strategy that still has to happen. You have to somehow fit into your enterprise authentication mechanism. Like I said, maybe you have to fit into your enterprise storage management technology because you can't just immediately go away from that. Um, but, but the longer goal is to simplify the IT infrastructure that people want to deploy against. Right? And just one more point on the integration topic. So we see the integration aspects as critical parts of HP-specific reference architectures, whether they become important parts of a, of a more general OpenStack uh, ref arches, I guess a separate question, but customers want us to describe specifically how key things like Active Directory are integrated into, into our cloud system solutions. So we would see that as, a, as an important part of the, of the ref arches that we deliver, whether it's a layered effect on top of what comes with the community or not, I don't know. Um, what, what form does this take? Is it a set of architecture diagrams, so I'm going to pull up rational rows or something. Um, is, is it, uh, sorry, old IBM <laughs> thing. Um, are, are you going to have deployment guides and have step-by-step, -step, this is how you set this thing up? Um, we have, we have what is the form? Right. Predefined, you know, you want to buy the system, you can buy the system sorts of environments mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's going to take multiple forms, but a, a, at the minimum, a document that says, this is how we recommend you deploy our reference, <laughs> that's, that's right. kind of the baseline for what I think we all work from, right? Right, I agree. Yeah, I was going to say the form ought to take s some project or some project in, in, in the making and a set of folks from the community uh, sitting down and, and starting to work something out. We, we probably need to, just like right. with any, any project or any en enhancement, any blueprint, let's go get people to work on it. And let's, the answer might be very different in a few months from what we think it is out of the gate, but until we work on it, um, we're just gonna keep talking about it, so. 
So um, I'd like to see everybody copy us. We have this modular reference architecture. I mentioned it earlier. It's called Cloud Blocks. And if you look at Amazon and Google and Facebook, they all deploy in kind of more than one server approach. P sometimes people call it a pod or a cluster. And so, you know, we call it a block-based approach. It doesn't matter what you call it. All that matters is that, you know, you need this combination because it, we are sort of building system solutions, you know, in slightly different ways. But you need a, w a way to define what the unit is. Is it a rack? Is it a container? Is it a half a rack, a quarter a rack? Is it a triplet Facebook rack? And then you need to say, what is the network architecture in there? How are the things stacked and racked? How are they cabled and labeled? Where does the provisioning system go? Um, and so on. And if you can do all of that, if you can kind of marry sort of like the software template layout with the hardware template layout, then you could very cleanly define, you know, the reference architecture down in a way where you get sort of more a Lego building block approach. And that's what we've been trying to do. It's part of our secret sauce, but I don't actually want to own that. Um, I tried to talk, take it to the Open Compute Project guys, and they didn't quite get it. You know, maybe we as a community can use heat and, and, and some of these other tools to sort of help define. Like, I, you know, one thing I'm stuck on right now is I, I don't know how to describe a rack layout. You know, we just have a JSON block for that. But, you know, it's tricky, right? I mean, how, you know, some people like to rack from the bottom up. Some people like to rack from the top down. And some, people, some data centers have 19-inch racks, and some have 23. And it, it just, you know, it's pretty gnarly, right? Um, even though we're trying to virtualize stuff, the, the, the uh, rubber meets the road when it comes to the data center, because all data centers are different. <laughs> um, but there is a way to crack that nut. It just is going to require some effort. Yeah, I, I think actually maybe that's just what has to happen. We have to sort of post a set of blueprints effectively and say, look, here's my version of a generic reference architecture, right? And then we can all have the community process take hold and, and see if there is actually community interest in defining a more generic, simplified reference architecture that we can all build from. And like any proposed project blueprint, if not a lot happens, then we'll know what the answer is, right? So yeah. Yeah. All right, well, thanks. Um, any closing comments anybody has? Okay. Thanks. <laughs>